O oh God, bless and sanctify this wreath. Let its circle be for us a reminder of your never-ending love. May the kindling of each candle be for us a symbol of your Son, Jesus the Christ, the light of the world. In this season of preparation and expectation, may this wreath assist each of us in preparing to receive the gift of the Christ child, in whose name we pray. Sorry about the loss of audio, folks. Well, 
reading from the prophet Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning books. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. 
This morning we are using a chant to, for, for this uh, psalm, and I would invite you to sing this, that, all of the even uh, verses and I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thanks. the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing 
until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Given that New Year's Day consists of my PJs, the answer is a resounding no. <laughs> anyway, happy Advent. The story of our life with Christ begins anew as we begin a new church year. It's a time for joy and gratitude for being church, anticipation of what lies ahead, and a time to renew our commitment to keep striving to be bearers of holiness to a world that needs it. Traditionally, we have called Advent the penitential season, but we're coming to see how that's really something of a misnomer. Advent is not really a little Lent, as it was once called. Now, both are contemplative seasons of prayer, repentance, and sometimes fasting. But Advent has a very different tone and emphasis. Advent is less about contrition than it is about preparation, thinking about how we can create a space for the Holy One to come into the world to us and through us, and how we might recognize that Holy Presence in everyday life. Still, this can be a difficult time of year. Liturgically, we aren't quite into Christmas yet, but the rest of the world is. We may not be of the world, but we are in it, and that does affect us. Between the media hype, the mythos surrounding the holiday season, and rampant consumerism, many people waver between nostalgia and cynicism this time of year. And we church people are no exception. Now, don't get me wrong, nostalgia can be a lovely thing. Everyone here has their own examples of how nostalgia can be a real blessing. And we all have our examples of how nostalgia has a painful side. 
When we lose loved ones to death, find ourselves separated by geographical distance or pandemic restrictions, when a family has been fractured by divorce or estrangement, when personal circumstances have taken a turn for the worse, then nostalgia can become as much a burden as a blessing. If we have experienced significant losses or never had something we longed for, then nostalgia can easily morph into cynicism, a defensive posture we take to protect ourselves when we have been wounded or feel threatened. That has its utility, but when we take it to excess or get stuck there, it's a problem. Coping strategies we learn under duress don't tend to serve us well after that situation has passed. Advent helps us navigate that, guiding us out of both nostalgia and cynicism. It keeps us from getting stuck in either the idealism or sorrow of nostalgia and offers an antidote to cynicism. That's because Advent isn't about nostalgia, about looking back and waxing lyric about a lovely thing that happened long ago in Palestine, even though it looks like it on the surface. <laughs> Advent is about hope, which is the very opposite of cynicism. It's about looking forward to God's dream for the world being realized, watching and waiting for holiness to break into the world, creating a space for it and trusting that it will come to be, even if it doesn't look like it in any given moment. Our lessons today point brilliantly to that. Isaiah, the ultimate Advent prophet, <laughs> casts a powerful vision that sees beyond the social dysfunction at hand to something better. <clears throat> Significantly, it's not just a human pipe dream. It's a vision given by God to achieve God's purposes. Human beings have trouble with faithfulness, but God doesn't. So this is a vision we can trust. Isaiah was writing after Israel had fallen to Assyria and Judah was on the brink of destruction and exile. Hope, therefore, was an imperative because it was all the people had. Actions have consequences, so the people would have to take their lumps for unfaithfulness, but that would not have the last word. Their world would be restored and be more glorious than ever. The covenant would be renewed and expanding, opening it to everybody. Israel's God would be everyone's God. It would be a new way of being in the world together. Nationalism and international conflict would have no place. God's law, the great commandment to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves, would be the basic governing principle. It would be God who would join, judge the nations and administer justice. Everyone would have enough, so there would be no need to compete for scarce resources and no need to attack each other. Isaiah doesn't spell out that we have an active role to play in realizing this vision. Paul picks that up, though, and tells us more about what our role looks like. Paul exhorts us to lay aside the works of darkness. We are to shed them like the dirty clothes they are and put on the armor of light that is suitable for the task at hand. That means we don't covertly pursue self-serving behavior thinking we can get away with it. We don't. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, exercise your sexuality with integrity, and keep your word. We are to live honorably and set aside our own appetites and agendas for the sake of establishing New Jerusalem, that restored, renewed community of God. Side note, Paul doesn't say that this is easy. <laughs> it's not. Our gospel passage is one of those that's really easy to get wrong, and a lot of people do. 
it has been co-opted by a particular segment of Christianity to support the idea of the rapture where true believers are miraculously airlifted to heaven while the rest of humanity is left behind to suffer, suffer the great tribulation. Short story, that's not what Matthew intended. The author frames Jesus' basic message in the stock apocalyptic language of the day to make a point. This text was written roughly 50 years after Jesus and maybe 20-ish after Paul. The second coming, as Matthew's community had envisioned it, had not come to pass. The author knew they needed to remain faithful and keep doing what Jesus and later Paul had told them to do, realizing God's vision is foretold by Isaiah in their everyday doings. That's a message for us too. We don't know when Christ will appear and aren't supposed to. So we need to keep doing what we should be doing, feeding the hungry, tending the sick, welcoming the stranger, giving alms and helping the poor, being steadfast in prayer, not giving in to our own selfish whims. There's no denying that the present day is laden with good reasons for fear and anxiety. And honestly, I worry about people who gloss over it a lot. Advent reminds us that even in the face of bad stuff that is of our own making, God is faithful to God's promises. And that because of the incarnation that this season anticipates, our destiny and Christ's are forever bound together. There is a way forward, and we have an active role to play. We need to deal with the stuff of daily life, but we can't be so focused on ourselves and our stuff that we lose track of what time it is. And if midnight is the H hour, it's 11.58 p.m. GST, God standard time. One way or another, Christ will appear to each of us momentarily, and we need to be ready. We need to get up, get dressed, get busy, stay the course, and not waste time with unworthy pursuits. Has anybody seen the classic bumper sticker, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> it makes a great point about urgency, but it misses another. The goal of Christianity is not staying out of trouble with God. It's about entering a relationship with Jesus Christ, being transformed by it, and then letting our transformed lives make a difference in the world. It's about building that holy city that shines as a beacon to all, a community so beautiful, so fantastic, and so compelling that it's irresistible. In a post-Christian world, it's more important than ever that we understand God's dream for the world and work with God to make it real. In Advent, we make much of the incarnation contemplating the impending birth of the Christ child and everything it meant. That's okay. We just can't get stuck in the nostalgia of it or become cynical because more than 2,500 years after Isaiah, that shining city on the hill has barely broken ground. Mm -hmm. Advent is about waiting, but not waiting passively. Instead, we actively practice hope, which keeps us from getting stuck in an imagined past or in a troubled present. It's a hope that empowers us to get up, get dressed, and keep on keeping on with what Jesus calls us to do. We have the vision, the building permits, the blueprints, and the master carpenter is on hand to teach us how to use the tools. We have only to ask. In the words of Catholic songwriter Dan Schutte, awake from your slumber, arise from your sleep. A new day is dawning for all those who weep. The people in darkness have seen a great light. The Lord of our longing 
has conquered the night. We are sons of the morning, we are daughters of day. The one who has loved us has brightened our way. The Lord of all kindness has called us to be a light for his people, to set our hearts free. Let us build the city of God. May our tears be turned into dancing. For the Lord, our light and our love, has turned the night into day. In the name of the Holy One, who constantly breaks into the world anew, who casts a glorious vision, invites us to help make it real, and equips us to get it done. Amen. Amen. We believe in one God, Father, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is in and of us. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of God, of one being, through him all things made, for us and for our God. Amen. By the power of the Spirit, he became a part of the mercy of the Lord. For our sake, he was crucified by the touch of silence. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in the glory of the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the death and life. As the church worldwide celebrates the beginning of its new year, let us turn our minds and hearts to the larger community of which we are a part, saying, Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us mercy. For all peoples of every race, nation, and disposition, may your love so embrace us all that its power overcomes our conflicts, our defenses, and our fears. Quicken us to our true nature as your children, that we may love one another. Here we are, here we are. We practice. For all the churches of the world, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, and Pentecostal, may we grow together in our understanding of mission, that we may be strengthened in unity and united in acts of service. Call us to the one discipleship with its many gifts. For those who live in fear and confusion, whether they be stateless people in refugee camps or settled people hidden behind high fences, give to the vulnerable strength and to the secure vulnerability that our human compassion for one another may end in justice and give our societies a human race. Here, here, here. 
for this community, especially for those who suffer most, for the emotionally and physically ill, for the dying, for those who grieve. May we all, out of our own suffering, give comfort and support. For the larger community around us, especially for the newborn children, the homeless, and the imprisoned. May we create a world where shelter, food, and medical care are available for all, and where the law protects people for a better chance and better choices. Let us pray for the needs and concerns of this community. Remembering especially our Laundry Love congregation, all refugees and their supporters, for all elected officials and all church leaders in every order of ministry, for all who travel, and for all who experience homelessness, remembering especially Chad, Allie, Dylan, and Ryan. For whom else shall we pray? Mary Rodriguez. Marlene. Jeff. Nancy Ann. Christiane. I ask your prayers for all in need of God's healing gifts. For Hannah, Carrie, Kate, Jeff, Frank, Warren, Kate, Cassandra, Nancy Ann, Marlene, Ben, facing dialysis and transplant, Ruby, and Linda. For those in hospice, remembering especially Dottie and Judy and Betsy. For whom else shall we pray? I ask your prayers for all who have died, remembering especially actress Arlene, Irene Cara, for the victims of the Colorado and Virginia shootings, for Lila Haley, sister of Bernie Tonner, and for Ronnie Matthews. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and let light perpetual shine upon them. For whom else shall we pray? Michael. David Charlesworth. Let us give thanks for all the blessings of this life, remembering especially the lives and memories of those in whose honor the flowers are given and the uh, chapel light, David Charlesworth and June Garfield Schaefer. Thanksgiving for all church tech teams. Amen. On this first day of the year, we gather up our prayers and offer them to you, O Lord, knowing full well that there are signs in the sun and moon and stars and in the common events of ordinary life that call us to attend to your coming. Prepare us for the time of trial and for your dominion, coming now and at the close of the age. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our Lord. Most merciful God, we can have a
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, everybody. Have a good week. Happy Advent. Peace, everyone. Me too, Amy. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Peace to you. Peace, everyone. Out of my chair, chair. In a chair. Rose says, peace to you. We offer our mass this morning in honor of Dr. David Charlesworth, whose memorial service was yesterday. And we also offer it in honor of Lila Haley, uh, Bernie Tonner's eldest sister. We're so sorry to hear of her passing. And I know you're grateful for her. May her memory be a blessing. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
God the Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink, of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed. For us, therefore, therefore let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us your truth in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
continue to decorate our mitten tree by bringing warm things in for our children in our city. Uh, if you'd like to go upstairs and have a Keurig cup of coffee, that's fine. I brought some pumpkin bread I made. I uh, hope it's okay. And um, also, I think most of you got, we had a wonderful selection of writers from our parish, about 35 people write Advent meditations, and they're on the back of uh, back table. Thank you to Hank for handing them out and marketing them on the way into church. Go oh. peace and love and serve the Lord. Thanks, be to God.